Now give Jesus Christ the biggest hand clap you've ever given anybody on night one. Man, good crowd. How many of you are ready for God to do something great in your life? Can you say amen? Hi, Yaya. I love you. I don't know how to say I love you in Greek, but I love you. God bless you. I'm not even trying. I can barely speak English. Glad you think that was a joke. Well, God has great things in store for you this week. Can you say amen? I want you, if you have your Bible, real quick, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Actually, check that. Just go to Revelation 13. Just cut right to the main part. Revelation 13, verse 11. You know, the Bible is different from every other religious book because, of course, I'm biased, but the Bible was written by God. God the Holy Spirit threw 40-some different authors. And it all says the same thing. Maybe you took a humanistic course and they told you that it's full of contradictions. But if you flip a Bible to somebody that says that and ask them to show you one, they can never do it. They just heard somebody say the Bible's full of contradictions. It doesn't have any contradictions. The Bible's the inerrant word of God. And God said in his word, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The one that is, the one that was, and the one that is to come. So God doesn't live in time. We live in time. God knows the future better than we know the past. And about one-third of the Bible is prophecy. So you hear people asking, you know, I'm on social media quite a bit. We had people comment on our broadcast that were atheists. One guy was a Satanist, and, and, he, and they all said the same thing. I'm starting to want to reexamine what I think about the Bible. Because back in December, January, February of 2020, everything seemed normal. And so anybody that would preach on Bible prophecy and the world coming to an end and the stuff the Bible says, they'd just think, this guy's wound a little too tight. He should switch to decaf. But then when you had everything start to happen that happened, and the thing that you could see is how close we are to the things the Bible prophesied would happen that seemed so far out. You know, what does it say? Revelation chapter 13. The Bible says in verse 11, Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make, everybody say that. Say he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. And that's what you're seeing happen right now. People aren't really interested. Well, not, not everybody. Obviously, I'm, I'm with a group of people here that are interested in the truth. But you have a lot of people. You can show them all the information right in their face, and they don't want to see it. They'll just say, get that out of my blinking face. I don't want to see it. Because they're deceived. There's people, <laughs> there's people that would do. I mean, you had the Surgeon General say, don't buy masks, they don't help. And then switch it three months later and say, do buy masks, they do help. And people didn't do it when he didn't say, and then do it when he says. That no questioning about whether they, they were lied to. You had Fauci come right out and say that he intentionally lied about the masks to help get uh, more masks to the doctors. But then now you should, well, whoever trusts a liar? And there's no accountability. Open lying, no one cares. So it's almost like people enjoy being deceived. They're not, they're not searching for the truth. The Bible says, he deceived all the people who belong to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. Now check this part, 16, Revelation 13, 16. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark in the right hand or in the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. The Bible... <coughs> 
for all the things people get confused on in Revelation. There's things that are very simple. If you just stay with what's clearly written and don't try to figure out what the seven horns on the head mean and all that, and you just go with what's said. The Bible says there's going to be a one world ruler named Antichrist, capital A. There's not going to ever be a guy running for one world government named Joe Antichrist. The Bible calls him the Antichrist because he's going to operate under the exact opposite spirit that Christ operated. The Bible calls him the man of lawlessness. Everybody say lawlessness. So any spirit, any politician you see operating under a spirit where they don't care what the law says, they're for lawlessness. They're, they don't care. They're, they're fine with a police precinct being burnt to the ground, but then they get mad if somebody does something about the police precinct being burned to the ground. The Bible says when you see that happening, don't try to figure out what political party I'm in because I'm not in one. So just relax your little face and listen to what I'm teaching you out of the Bible. I can help you out. I'm trying to get you into heaven, not the GOP or the DNC. Can you say amen? So the Bible says there will be an antichrist, but it says in 1 John there are many antichrists. So why is there many antichrists? Because the devil, God doesn't operate on the devil's clock. The devil has to operate on God's clock. The devil does not know when Christ is going to rapture his church off the earth. So he's always had to have somebody ready and the structure ready to go. But now you can see. In fact, I'll have you, I'll have you go to Matthew 24 after all. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. The Bible says in verse 3, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives and his disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when will all this happen and what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Well, when they asked Jesus, what sign is going to signal your return to the earth? He didn't say, well, don't worry about that. He goes on one of the longest chapters in the Bible, Matthew 24, and gives them very specific signs. He says, you'll, you'll hear about wars and rumors of wars. There'll be violence everywhere. The Bible says you'll be dragged into jail because of your allegiance to me. Now, somebody would have told you that in America, there would be pastors arrested in the year 2020 for having church on Sunday morning in their own building. If someone would have told you that in January, you'd have told them, you need, you need to ease off the crack or the coffee or, or, or whatever you're having, because that's not going to happen. We've got a First Amendment. But my friend who's preached here in this church, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown, got arrested the Monday after he held service in his church because they pumped people full of so much fear that people actually thought they were doing a, a service to haul any... I mean, you should have read the comments that were written under their Facebook page. 18,000 comments. I wish they'd build a fence around your church property and you stupid people can all die together. And I'm using stupid to be kind. They use much harsher language than that. Jesus said the day will come where you'll be hated because of your allegiance to me. But then look at this sign that he gives that's the, the clear sign in the Bible. Mark, Matthew 24, 32. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things begin to happen, you can know my return is near, even at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation, which generation? The generation that sees the fig tree bud again will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. So Jesus said, for some reason in church, they always focus just on that part. Well, Jesus said nobody will know the day or the hour. Yeah, we're not picking a day and an hour. You can scroll back through 18 years of my preaching and try to find one place where I said, on November 1st at 12.10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Jesus is going to come back to the earth. Anybody that does that, you know they've left the, 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 the Spirit of God and biblical uh, accuracy right off the bat. Jesus said, nobody will know the day or the hour. But as clearly as he said, no one will know the day or the hour, he did say you would know the season 
and he put his finger on one generation of people. That he said the generation of people that see this sign, they will still be on the earth when all these things happen again. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. What was the sign? The generation that sees the fig tree, but again. Every one of Jesus' speakers, or Jesus' hearers, knew what he was talking about when he said the fig tree. But I mean, everybody knows. Catholic people know. Presbyterian people know. Everybody knows. When he said the generation that sees the fig tree, but again, he was talking about a nation. A nation is the fig tree, and the nation being reborn. What nation was he talking about? Israel, which had already been taken over by the Roman government. And May 14th, 1948, that prophecy was fulfilled. Can a nation be reborn in one day? May 14th, 1948, Israel is reborn as a nation in one day. Jesus said, no, the generation that sees that sign take place, they will still be here on the earth when I come back again. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. You have people ask you all during this time, what do you, what's this world coming to? An end. The world is not going to continue forever as you see it. The world will come to an end. The Bible says there's going to be a quickening called the rapture of the church. People say, well, the word rapture is nowhere in the Bible. That's correct because the Bible wasn't written in English. But it was written in uh, Greek and then into Latin, and it's rapturo and raptus, which means the great catching away of the saints. Turn a few pages back to Matthew 13. I wouldn't read so much scripture, but the more blank looks I get, the more I re- realize I need to. The more I've been watching the riots, too, I've started to realize not everyone was raised in Sunday school. So I'll read more. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 24. Here's another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted tares among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the tares also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, The field where you planted that good seed is full of tares. Where did they come from? An enemy has done it, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the tares, they asked. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I'll tell the harvesters to sort out the tares, tie them in bundles and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. Now, you skip down, it says parable of wheat and weeds explained. So later, the Bible says, when they left the crowds, Jesus went into the house. The disciples said, please explain to us the story of the tares in the field. So it makes me laugh to think that the disciples, when the crowd was there, were sitting up with Jesus on the platform going, that's powerful. That's so true. Then as soon as they were with Jesus by themselves, they went, what in the world were you talking about with the, the tares and wheat? Jesus replied, the son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send His angels And they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the righteous, everybody say, that's me. The righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So the Bible says that the farmer was God and he he put He sowed a wheat field, and an enemy came in, the devil, and sowed tares among the wheat. If you study tares, they grow up, they look like wheat, but they choke out the wheat. And so the farmhands came and said, hey, master, somebody came in and sowed tares among the wheat, and it's going to harm the wheat. 
We should pull them out. And the master said, no, you can't pull them out now. If you did, you would damage the wheat. That's why I want to take time and tell you this. Anybody that you hear tell you that God sent COVID-19 to judge the earth because he's upset about abortion or all the other sins uh, that America does. I've heard, I've heard all kinds of preachers. I've had them call me on the phone. We really need to repent because that's the only way God's going to stop sending this plague on America. God doesn't send things to destroy countries where his children live and he's got children in every country of the world. That's what that scripture tells you. They said, hey, listen, this world's too far gone. Let's just yank all the tares out now. And the, God said, no, if you do that, you'll damage the wheat. I had an old, older pastor who should know better. He called me and said, I think, I think God is doing this to judge America. I said, let me ask you a question. You think God got so mad at America that he just decided to wipe out people in nursing homes that have absolutely nothing to do with what's going on? I mean, you know as well as I do, we, we both live in the Northeast, uh, mid-Atlantic. I'm in Pennsylvania. You're up here in Massachusetts. Pennsylvania, yet 66% of the people that died of COVID-19 are in long-term care facilities. New York, before they altered the numbers, was higher than that. New Jersey, high. Massachusetts, high. From storing COVID-19 patients in Pennsylvania, our director of health mandated that long-term care facilities hold COVID-19 positive patients and those people with compromised immune systems, they said it went through there like a match through dry grass. It's just under 50% of the deaths in the United States are in long-term care facilities. I said to that guy, you explain to me what sense it makes that God got mad at America and decided to wipe out old church ladies living in nursing homes. Explain that to me. He said, I never thought of it like that. I don't think you thought of it at all. People just wake up in a bad mood and start preaching crap. Jesus said, and I remember, I consider Jesus an expert in the Christian faith. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes, the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. No wonder you have so many confused people in this country. If the preachers are telling you that it's God's will to wipe out people in nursing homes. No. When you see things being killed, destroyed, and stolen, it's not God. It's the devil. But Jesus came to undo the work of the devil that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's why I'm here with you in Fitchburg this week. I'm not here to see you get finished off. I'm here to see God take you from low to high by his power in Jesus' name. If you receive that tonight, put those Massachusetts hands together and give God a mighty shout of praise. Yeah, God, God's not looking to destroy you. God's looking to help you. A very present help in time of trouble. Where do you see Jesus going around in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John killing people? Oh, you're having a good day, are you? Hey, now you're dead. How messed up does your doctrine have to be? Well, I think God's judging America. No, I'm going to tell you how it works. God is going to judge the world, but not while the wheat are still here. First, the angels will harvest the wheat and pull it into the barn, and then the tares will be burned with never-ending fire. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. People have screwy doctrine. Never preached on Bible prophecy in their life, and then there, there's a lockdown, and all of a sudden they just start putting messages together. Revelation 3. Now, if you read Revelation 1, 2, and 3, the word church is used in some tens 19 times. And then once you get out, notice how, how most of the writing is in red, because Jesus appears... To John, when he's 92 years old, and tells him to write these letters back to the churches. <coughs> Those coughs are COVID free. I just started smoking before the service. That's all. I'm ashamed to admit it. But we don't judge here. I was trying to look cool. Now I just have a cough. Revelation 3, verse 14. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea, the pastor. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, 
the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do. This is Jesus speaking to the church. That you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me. Gold that's been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. And buy white garments. Everybody say white garments. That's Jesus telling you to live pure. This is actually the seven churches that Jesus wrote to represent the seven church ages. Not only were they seven churches that were there at that time, but they're the seven church ages from the time John was writing that till now. You can break the church into seven ages, ages from 40 A.D. to where we're at right now. And so how does he sum up our final church age? The lukewarm church. The church that says I'm rich, I have everything I need, I don't need prayer, I got money for medication, I don't need any help from God, I have a good job, I have a savings account. And Jesus said, tell them that you say you're rich, but you're actually miserable and blind and poor and naked. And that, I mean, how could you sum it up any better? People got money, savings account, and they're the least happy people you could ever meet. Have to have a pill to get up, pill to get through the day, pill to go to back, back to bed at night. Jesus said, I, I adjure you to buy gold from me, and then you'll be rich. And white garments, so you'll not be shamed by your nakedness. And ointment for your eyes, so that you'll be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. What did Jesus address for this final age of the church? Indifference. Pastor, uh, when are we opening our church back up? I don't know. Maybe March 2021. I hear they might have a vaccine out sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. So, Indifferent. You're in the last hour of time, and you've got 60% of the churches in this country shut. Well, it's dangerous. Liquor stores open. Marijuana dispensaries open. Planned Parenthood's open. The church should be open to preach the gospel to the lost. Indifference. Plenty of money in the bank. No need to open up. That's what it is. God just announced with a major ministry. This week, they're gonna, he's, gonna, he's keeping his church shut. He, and he's in a state where the governor was one of the first ones to open up. He has no, no government opposition, no nothing. We're going to open up maybe March 2021. Why? Why? Plenty of money. No urgency. I want you to know the reason we're having meetings here is not because me and Pastor Brian are bored. The reason we're having these meetings is the Bible, A, what I've I've just showed you from scriptures, if you know that time's running out, and time is running out, then what is the posture supposed to be of somebody that knows the Bible? Good luck to everybody. I'm locking my doors and ordering Uber Eats and, and Amazon, and you people can fend for yourselves. Or are you to take the message of the gospel and get it to as many people as possible so that those that are bound and hurting and broken and on their way to hell can call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be delivered from all their trouble? That's why we're here. I said that's why we're here. You don't have to limp into heaven. And you don't have to miss heaven. You can make up your mind tonight. July 19th, 2020, I'm getting right with God. I'm going to get my life totally on track, and I'm never turning back in Jesus' name. And if you do that, you're not only going to make heaven. God will empower you with his spirit and use you to find other people that were once like you are or like you are now. They don't think there's any way out. They've tried every prescription medication. They've tried every street drug. And they're more miserable now than they've ever been. They need Christ. Jesus is the answer for the problems that are in this world. Look, I stand, turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Not I might come in. 
Jesus said, look, if you realize <laughs> you've been indifferent, I stand at the door and knock. If you will simply hear my voice and open the door, I'm not going to judge you. So it's a little late now, isn't it? You lived your whole your own life for 21 years. Now you think you're just going to open the door and I'm going to. No, that's not Jesus. That's snotty religious people. That's not Jesus. Jesus is the friend of sinners. The Bible calls Jesus the friend of sinners. Can you say amen? He sought out sinners. He actually, if you read it, couldn't stand religious people. He was rebuking Pharisees and Sadducees, left, right, and center. You, you whitewashed sepulcher full of dead man's bones. He didn't talk like that to prostitutes. He talked like that to people that ran the temple, that hated sinners, that wouldn't pray for the sick, that were happy with their little relationship with God. Those were the people that irritated Jesus. But he looked for publicans and sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes to tell them. He said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And I, the Son of Man, have come to seek and save that which is lost. If you're thankful that Jesus is a friend of sinners, let him hear you one more time tonight in Massachusetts he's a friend of sinners so even when he was ticked off in Revelation chapter 3 he still ends the whole thing with I stand at the door and knock if any man hears my voice and opens the door I'll come in and we'll share a meal together as friends those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he says to the churches. Now, this is powerful because then that wraps up the seventh church age. Then look at the next verse in chapter 4, verse 1. John said, then as I look, see the new Alan DeCoff? <laughs> Dr. Fauci taught me that. I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up hither, and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly, I was in the Spirit. And the word church or churches is never mentioned again for the rest of the book of Revelation. So there's a warning to the church. And then John hears a voice and sees a door in heaven and hears Christ say, come up hither. And instantly, I was caught up in the Spirit. And from that point on, judgment begins to come down from heaven onto the earth. So what's the difference between the stage that we're living in right now that the Bible calls the beginning of sorrows or birth pains leading up to the tribulation? You know, it's amazing how, how little doctrine Christians have. They have a lockdown. They're starting to talk, you know, unemployment. It starts creeping up towards 30%. All of a sudden you got people preaching on Christian TV. We're in the tribulation. No, we're not. You know how I know? Because me still here. And the wheat gets harvested before the judgment comes from heaven. So what sent coronavirus? Well, I mean, first of all, you don't have to get all mystical about it. There's a bioweapons lab in Wuhan, China. And whether on purpose or by accident, one of them got out. And once it got out, that ship sailed. So you don't have to get all spiritual. Now, how did that happen? That's how it happened. Mystery solved. It came, it came, it came from, from a virological uh, weapons lab, whatever they want to call it. They study weapons or study viruses, whatever. And then, 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 it, then it spread. So here we are. But Jesus said, before he comes back, there'll be plagues. Plagues are incurable sicknesses and diseases. He said they'll happen more and more. That's why it was so stupid. Of course, if you watch me on YouTube, I was railing on the same thing from March. Do you want to know why? Because I've read the Bible. If the Bible says there's going to be plagues more and more until the coming of the Lord, then that means this one's not going to be the last one. So however a church reacts to this one, you set the tone for how you're going to react to all of them. So what are you going to do? Every time there's a virus, you're going to shut the doors of the church till you get the all clear again? Because the Bible doesn't say there's going to be one. The Bible says they'll happen more and more. Can you say amen? They're going to look for ways to shut the church down. I'm going to tell you right now. The wickedness that came on the heels of this virus that it was used as a smoke screen for. That back in March, when the, what are we in? Day 122 of 15 days to slow the spread. That when they said that back then, 
all this stuff that they're looking to pass on the back heels of it and totally rewrite law and undo constitutional freedom. And you could feel it back in March that something wasn't right. Whatever wickedness is being planned, look where it all leads. The exact same place the Bible said it would lead, a one world government with a one world money system that no man can buy or sell without a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So what do you have being openly discussed right now? That we're waiting for a vaccine, that when you get the vaccine, there'll be a digital implant that shows that you've received the vaccine, then that, that's when you'll be allowed to travel internationally again. That's when you'll be able to enter society again. That's, being, that's not on some weirdo conspiracy website. That's being discussed on NBC News, CBS News, Bill Gates discussing it in open forum, just like the Bible said. And so when you see that happen, what do you do? Go buy land up in northern Saskatchewan? Some AK-47, some powdered milk? I mean, that's what you see Christians do. I, I have a freezer full of food, and I have over 11,000 rounds of ammunition. So that's what you're going to do as a Christian before Jesus comes back? Just blow your neighbors away that are coming for your food? Hey, our neighbors are starving. They're coming for our freezer. You know, somehow I don't think that's the plan of God. Is that what Jesus did with the five loaves and two fish? Put them in a secure container and then beat the people that came to get it? No. Somebody say no. So what's God's plan for the last days, knowing these things are happening? See, you're seeing the whole framework. That's why this is going to produce the greatest revival that America's ever seen. Because it's like everything that was being done in secret is now being exposed openly where people can see now that this Antichrist system is now a half step from being implemented. But I've got good news. The devil doesn't get to pick when he gets to implement it because while the church is on the earth, the church is still in charge. Jesus said... I will build my church. Not I'll give my church power to survive. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Can I prophesy something? As quickly as this virus came, so shall a great awakening come upon the United States and the nations of the world. And one last great harvest of souls shall come into heaven before it's eternally too late. Why should Lemonster and Fitchburg be left out? My prayer is that it starts here this week that America gets swept with a mighty revival in Jesus' mighty name. If you receive that with me, take 15 good seconds, clap your hands, Give God a mighty shout of praise. It's not the devil's time yet. It's the time of the church. Say this from your heart. Say, greater is he who lives in me than all those that are in the world. Now just lift your hands and begin to thank God that God's not finished with you yet. Thank Him that He's not finished with you yet. The devil doesn't get to determine your destiny. No. It's not His time yet. Man, it's going to be a great week. Unless you're a demon. If you're a demon, you're going to get your ribs broken. Your little demon ribs. Turn to Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and never disaster. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I know the plan I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Everybody say plans to prosper me. Say never to harm me. So you get 
some, you know, any, any guy you've never heard of before in your life that, that, that has a Facebook ministry. I want to base my life on it. You know, I had a dream, and the Lord just showed me that there's going to be major trouble ahead. Well, for you, maybe. But God already told me what his plan is in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plan I have for you, says the Lord. Aren't you glad God's not unsure of his plan for you? I used to know the plan I have for you, says the Lord. But now this whole COVID thing hit, and I don't know what's going on. I know the plan I have for you, says the Lord. And then he tells you what the plan is. A plan to prosper you. Everybody say, to prosper me. Do you think God needs the help of the Federal Reserve? Or some kind of executive order at the state or federal level to prosper you? Do you think God can only prosper you if the Dow Jones is above 25,000? Or do you think the God that sent ravens twice a day to feed Elijah bread and meat can do that for you? You're going to find out that God operates independently of the government. He doesn't need any help from anybody. When God makes up his mind to bless you, every person on earth could make up their mind that they disagree and it wouldn't make one bit of difference. God doesn't need anybody's permission to get to you. He can find you wherever you are if you call on his name. And God has blessing with your name on it. These last six months of 2020, if you stay hooked in with God, they'll be the greatest six months you've ever had. Because I want you to hear what God said. He said, hey, that's me. Why am I interrupting myself? You tell that little digital me to stop preaching. Maybe I'll just let him finish the service. I'd actually take a break. God said, or Jesus said, I will build my church. Who's the head of the church? Jesus. Some of you, oh, I'm very worried about the state of the church. I'm not. Because the head of the church does a great job. He's been running it flawlessly for 2,000 years. I will build my church. Not I'll give my church power to survive. That's why I'm not building a bunker. That's why I'm not buying land somewhere and fencing it. No. I will build my church. Not give my church power to survive. I'll multiply my church. Turn to Isaiah chapter 2. What a great Sunday night crowd. I'm telling you, this is going to be a fantastic week. How many of you drove uh, 45 minutes or more? That's awesome. I wasn't, never used to ask that because all you had to do to drive 45 minutes in Massachusetts was live three miles away or more. But now the roads are empty. Never thought I'd see Interstate 93 in Boston, just like a video game racing mode on, set on easy. No cars. Isaiah 2. In the last days. What days are we in right now? So the Bible tells you more about the last days. The mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. And his word will go out from Jerusalem. The Bible says, the Lord's house will be the highest of all. And people from all over the world will ask, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of Jacob's God, so that he can teach us his ways and walk in his paths. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Christ is coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. The Bible says the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. God's not coming back for a weak, defeated, hiding church that's waiting for a vaccine. He's going to come back for a church that's victorious. 
that's casting out devils, healing the sick, and rescuing the lost. So you know, you know what that tells you? This little hiccup that we hit. The last four months, five months, that's all it is, a hiccup. If you're getting ready for three years of just the church going down and us having to hide, yeah, there's going to be more persecution against, against Christianity. You know why it's hitting? The devil knows what's coming. And any time he knows what's coming, he tries to hit it ahead of time to shut it down. But if you read it, it never works. He knew Moses was going to be born in that generation of Hebrew children. So Pharaoh passed a law that all Hebrew babies, boys, had to be killed. But they missed one. They missed Moses. He got out anyway. And he told Pharaoh, let my people go. And with signs and wonders, he confirmed the word of God and brought the Israelites out. Can you say amen? He knew Jesus was going to be born in that generation. An order came. All the baby boys in Bethlehem, two and younger, have to go. But an angel came and tipped Joseph off. One of those wise men brought gold to the baby shower. That Bible scholars tell you that's what Joseph and Mary lived on down in Egypt. God prepared a place for them. While they were in Egypt and gave them the money ahead of time. And then when it was safe they went back and Jesus undid the devil's plan. The devil knows the greatest revival that's ever hit planet earth. We're on the cusp of it right now. So he tried to shut down the church. They said we'll never be able to meet like this again. We'll never have mass gatherings. But that plan of the devil failed. And churches all over the country are meeting right now. And we're getting ready to see the devil get his head kicked in one last time by the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. And I made up my mind. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to watch it happen. I'm going to see it happen. I'm going to be a part of what God's going to do before Jesus comes back. And I'm telling you if that's what brought you out here tonight. God will anoint you anew and afresh tonight with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in fire because you can't stand against the wickedness of this world because you're a good person or you have a good heart. You need the fire of God to come down on the inside of you where you stop caring what people think and you say like Peter and John, Sirs, we would please God rather than man and stand against the devil and win this last great victory for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you believe God will use you like that? Good, because I do too, or I want to be preaching like this. If I thought you were a pack of losers, I'd just shut it down by now. Go get ice cream. Bible says in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Young men, old men, young women, old women, all flesh. There's nobody in here. You're not too woman. You're not too man. You're not too old. You're not too young. The devil gives everybody a reason why they can't be used. <coughs> Nobody had more reasons than me. When the Lord called me to preach when I was eight years old in my bedroom, going up to change for bed, and I had an encounter with God. I had a speech impediment, eight sounds in the alphabet that I couldn't say correctly that I had to miss recess twice a week to go get speech therapy, and they never corrected one sound. Crooked feet, three non-surgical procedures. They tried on my legs to straighten my legs out. None of them worked. And an angel shows up in my room. I never used to tell people the angel story because everybody I ever heard talk about angels seemed like they were nuts. But now in America, if you believe the Bible, they think you're nuts. They might as well tell the story too. <laughs> but this really happened. Only one I ever saw. Jonathan. God has reserved you for this last period of time to be an evangelist, to call men and women that are now in darkness into the light, for soon it will be eternally too late. Do you understand? And I said yes in my speech impediment. And when I said yes, the angel left. And I felt different. I now understood there was more to life than what you see with your natural eye. You know, you read in the book of 2 Kings, the Bible says, they sent the military to arrest Elisha. They've been arresting preachers for thousands of years. You're not going to be looked down on if you go to heaven and you never went to and you went to jail. You'll go, you're going to get looked down on if you never went to jail. Half that book was written by felons. That's a fact. 
Paul was in prison. Every time I went to prison, he said, hey, somebody give me a pen and paper. I need to have some writing to do. <laughs> I realize now there was more than this life. There really is a heaven. What Jesus said in Mark 8, 36 and 37, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses what? Lose his soul in the process. Verse 37, Mark 8, 37, is there anything more valuable for, than a man's soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? America doesn't know that stuff. Anybody dies in America, it's rest in peace, he's in a better place. The devil could die in a car accident and they'd write on Facebook, rest in peace, he's in a better place. And I'm not saying that you should condemn people to hell on Facebook the day they die, but I am saying the Bible doesn't teach everybody's in a better place when they die. The Bible doesn't say... Narrow is the way that leads to hell for the few, and the way that leads to heaven is broad. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction for the many who choose the easy way, but the path that leads to heaven is straight and narrow, and only a few there be that find it. Why? Because it doesn't take anything to go to hell. My dad has a sermon he preaches, what do you have to do to go to hell, and it only has one point, nothing. It's true. You're born in sin. Shaping an iniquity, and you just go with the flow. There's no backlash on hating the church nowadays and hating God. You know, they just cut, cut the head off of a Jesus statue down in the church in Miami. They defaced another Mary statue burning churches down all through France. There's no backlash for being a hater of God and hating the Bible. You went to public school like I did. They start mocking the Bible. If you stand up for it, it's not like it's not like everybody joins your side. You're the only one. People look at you like, "Would you? You've been in a coma since 1820. We don't believe that book anymore." All the flow leads to hell. You don't you don't get any backlash for drinking until you're blackout drunk. Some of you had family that you were into drugs and alcohol heavy. You never heard one thing from your family. Then you decided to go to church, and then you heard from them. I don't think, I don't think you need to go there. You need to be careful going. They never told you to be careful when you were at a heroin house out cold for six days. But then the second, the second that you go, sorry, I'm moving up here. It's safe. I thought I was getting attacked. stay behind this metal pulpit <laughs> then the second you went to go to church isn't it funny nobody ever tried to talk you out of going to a bar nobody ever tried to do, talk you out of doing anything destructive then the second you go to church I, I think you need to be careful <laughs> I think you need to be careful going there you know I heard that pastor I don't even think he's been a pastor that long I think they just want all your money so did Budweiser What do you think Sam Adams wants? To be your friend? To have like a lifelong relationship? Amazing how everybody gets concerned about your money when you start going to church. I think they just want your money. Yeah. What do you think Walmart wants like to be your BFF? How much does it come to? You know, you've been coming through this line so many times. I just don't even feel right taking your money. There's no pushback to go with the flow that goes to hell. Broad is the way for the many that choose the easy way. But the path that leads to heaven is straight and narrow. And only a few there ever be that find it. Because the moment you make up your mind, you know what? I, I don't think I'm meant to just fling my body around, having sex with whoever, drink until I'm blackout drunk, doing drugs, being depressed. I, I think I'm meant for something greater. I'm going to go God's way. Then the devil does everything in his power to push you back in your place. But I got news for the devil. God gave his spirit to give you power to do what you set out to do and to be who God's made you to be. Turn to John chapter 5. Notice what Jesus said. In Revelation chapter 3, 
He said, to all who overcome, I will cause them to sit on my throne. Anybody that makes it to heaven has to overcome something. Nobody gets a free run up the sideline. I've had, I've had the devil try a myriad of stuff to stop me. I had to get a lawyer and sue the attorney general in Pennsylvania. I, I preached through the whole lockdown. You think I'm going to shut down preaching? In the hour of the great, the suicide hotline in one state, they normally get 1,000 calls a month. They got 25,000 calls. People just drinking themselves to death during the lockdown. Suicides up, overdoses up. You let all that stay open because the state gets a cut and you're going to tell preachers to shut up. There's things I'm already willing to go to jail for. I made up my mind on that when I was like nine. Because my dad told me. My dad's been preaching 42 years. He's preaching. I won't say where he's preaching. You have to quarantine for 14 days if you go to where he's preaching. And he went anyway. And they had 50, 50 people lined up in the airport. I said, how'd you get, how did you get, how did you uh, not have to quarantine for 14 days? He said, I went around them. <laughs> so we're different. My dad told me. My dad said, uh, the day will come where they're going to try to do away with religious freedom. Because if that's true, that there's going to be a one world religion, a one world government, no man can buy or sell without a mark, they're going to come against it one day. My dad told me that when I was nine. I made up my mind to none. Okay, well, when that day comes, I'm not going quietly. I'm going to preach. Peter got arrested a lot. Every time they arrested Peter, you read in the Bible, he's asleep. Like he's, oh, okay, there's my cell. All right. When the angel broke him out of prison in Acts chapter 12, the Bible says the angel had to smite him. That means slap. To wake him up. You know, angels aren't used to that. Normally when they appear, people are like, wow. He's like, oh, who's at the bright light? Oh, tone down the heavenly brightness. It's like two in the morning. The day will come. Well, they'll come against this. You know why? Because hell's plan can't prevail while the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is doing its work. I've talked to former witches who ended up getting saved the week I was preaching at a place, and you know how they ended up coming to the meeting? They said, we were in the woods doing our thing, and we couldn't get anything to work, and we could feel a power coming from a place and went to check where it was, and it was the meeting we were having down in Alabama. They could tell. So... I believe the strategy was to shutter the church and scatter the believers. Yeah, but what's the difference whether we meet in a building, amen, or online? You want to know what the difference is? According to Pew Research Group, 53% of church members said they never watched one online service in the month of, of uh, June. That's the difference. Just like when they went to online-only education, Los Angeles County just said 50-plus percent of their students never logged into one class. I know, shocking. I would have also been in that 50%. There's power when the saints gather. I said there's power when the saints gather. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 10.25, you should be meeting together more often instead of less often as you see the day approaching. You can't have this in your kitchen watching it on the internet. You can't lay hands on people on the internet. You can't serve communion on the internet. You can't water baptize on the internet. You can't anoint with oil on the internet. I could run through a bunch of other stuff you can't do on the internet. The devil wanted the scattering of the saints, but guess what? When those riots broke out and all the governors marched with them and then the federal courts ruled what you do for one, you have to do for everybody, it undid all their rules that put restrictions on the gathering. You want to know another thing? One of the good things is people have been pushed enough now that they don't care anymore. They just ruled in California that they can't have any church again. There's a pastor that Pastor Rodney and myself know. He decided he's meeting anyway. He had two services this morning. He had 800 show up in his first service out, outside on the, 
under a tent and then had another service after that with even more. I'm going to tell you right now, if the devil thinks he can shut this thing down, it'll be a cold day in hell with the devil sucking popsicles before he shuts down the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you are anointed... Listen, you are anointed for such a time as this. You're not getting shut down. The greatest work that you've ever done for God, you're not going to do it last year. You're going to do it now. Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of Almighty God. Come on, if you receive that, go ahead and give it up to God one more time. Come on, let the devil hear you. Somebody shout hallelujah. John 5, 1. Then I'm going to play a video for you, then I'm going to pray for you. Then I'll leave you alone for about 22 hours. John 5, 1. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. <clears throat> Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethsaida with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. Everybody say 38 years. So you think you've had a problem a long time? And you may have. This guy had one a super long time. That's a long time to be battling the same thing. When Jesus saw him and knew how long he had been ill, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said. For I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And instantly. Everybody say instantly. So he goes from 38 years where he can't get free to Jesus speaks one word to him. And boom. Life comes into his dead legs. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man <coughs> who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But, Jesus, but, but the man replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you're better, so stop sinning, lest a worse thing come upon you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Can you imagine seeing a guy crippled for 38 years and he's up walking and you're mad? Hey, who told you you can walk? You sit back down. Let me tell you, if it was me, I'd have rolled up my sleeping mat like a wiffle ball bat and beat those Pharisees till they had the welded up, most welded up legs you ever saw in your life. Till they were laying there needing somebody to heal them. Can you imagine? You haven't walked in 38 years and Jesus heals you and you're up walking. Excuse me. You know it's Saturday. You sit, you sit your butt back down. Put that mat where it was. But you know what? I won't even ask for a show of hands. How many of you have had the Lord set you free? You quit doing drugs and started walking in the right direction. You quit whatever bondage you were in and started heading in the right direction. And instead of people being happy for you, people started to try to get you to go back to your old life. Oh, you think you're better than us now. No, I'm just walking. Yeah, I haven't been able to walk in four decades. I figured I'd go out for it. Now, you, you look at you walking with attitude. <laughs> you know, it's not that he's walking. It's like the way that he walks. That he, he like walks like he's better than me. And it, it makes me, I told him to sit down. <laughs> because the enemy, listen to this, the enemy can't stop God's power working in your life. He can only surround you with people that try to get you to be ashamed of it. And I felt so strong in my belly coming out tonight that if we're this close to the end of time, when Christ is going to call people out of the earth that have stayed pure and living righteous, Whoever the enemy is trying to use, whether it's a visible person, whether it's things in the invisible realm, that's what you call demons. I saw an angel of God. Two-thirds of the angels stayed up. Lucifer got thrown out of heaven. One-third followed him down. We call those demons. Demons are assigned to people 
to try to get them to, to not be able to advance. But you don't have to worry about that. Because if one third got kicked out, two for every one that got kicked out stayed. And the Bible says you have angels ordered to protect you wherever you go. And then God sends ministers. Ministers aren't sent to discourage you. How many of you are having a, be- a hard life? Well, I'm just going to tell you, it's probably not going to get much better. Amen. No, that's not what a minister is supposed to do. A minister, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes. Faith is not something you join, the Presbyterian faith. Faith is a power that comes from the Word of God. That with no reason to hope, you say, if the Lord is for me, who can be against me? My tomorrow is going to be all right. You can't buy that at CVS. Faith has to get preached into your spirit by somebody that's anointed of the Holy Ghost to preach. That's what we're doing all this week. We came to tell everybody that feels like giving up, that feels like they're not going to make it, that doesn't know the way forward, that's tired of trying to keep their head above water, that the God that began a good work in you, he's not going to give up on you now. He's going to take you from where you are now and bring you over to the other side in Jesus' mighty name. For some people, it's sickness, some depression, some addiction, alcohol, whatever. But there's nothing the devil has done to you that God can't do something about it tonight. That's why I'm here. When we pray, I'm not going to pray that God helps you. Jesus didn't kneel down by by the crib and say, Lord, just help him. He said, stand up and walk. He's a miracle working God. A miracle gives you power to do now what you couldn't do. You don't have to have a 12-year battle with getting free from alcohol. There is a name that is above every name. That at the mention of the name of Jesus, every chain of alcohol, every chain of depression. Hey, if you experience some kind of trauma as a child and it's never left you, the Lord can break that sucker off of your neck permanently in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, give the Lord glory. He's a miracle. He's a miracle working God. You don't have to put up with the devil's mess. Well, I guess, I guess that's just my cross to bear. No, it's not. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, your cross is your personal commitment to advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ in your generation. My cross to bear was preached in the last 49 nights. Outside in Tampa at 97 degrees and 3 zillion percent humidity. I was at 183 pounds when I started. I'm starting to look like Kate Moss in 1992. I don't know why anybody even showers in Florida. You walk to your car, you look like you ran the Boston Marathon. Just go outside, the sweat just finds you. That was, I'm not complaining. I'm thankful to preach, but boy, I was losing weight, a lot of weight. I was like seeing visions and stuff, but it was just heat stroke. So I almost got into bad doctrine. I see Jesus. No, you just need some water. Can you say amen? Can you say a better amen? Say so the devil can you say, God's not finished with me yet. I'm going to tell you, life doesn't have to finish the way it started. I'm going to tell you another thing. If life started hard, you don't have to claw your way out of it. God will reach down his hand. The Bible says he'll pull you out of the pit and he'll set your feet on the rock to stay. You're only one prayer away from a miracle. That man was crippled for 38 years. It didn't take Jesus 38 seconds to raise him up. There should be a reward for you coming to church two times in a day. Some of you told your family, where are you going? Church. Didn't you just go this morning? Yeah. Uh, Are you becoming a nun? (laughs) Is it Christmas already? (laughs) They don't know that you're drunkenly in love with Jesus Christ. God's going to put his hand on your life tonight. You're going to enjoy the rest of this year. You're going to run with the wind of the Holy Ghost behind you. And if you think you're wrapped up with something too hard for God to knock off, watch this. 
then I'm going to pray for you. This is my uncle. Praise God. Stand, little sister. Could you hold her Bible and stuff, please? Hallelujah. Everybody lift your hands. Pause Hallelujah. it real quick. Take a step of faith. Now, if you never... The gifts of the Spirit pause working. it real quick. If you, it's the button it's with like, like the two bars. Stone in a pond, the ripples. <laughs> if... Uh, if you've never seen something like this, just so you don't think it's weird, my uncle's been preaching almost 50 years. He also, he didn't see an angel. He was uh, seven, a year younger than I was when I saw the angel. He was playing in a field in West Virginia. And uh, Jesus came to him, and it scared him pretty bad. And he said, I'm going to give you a gift. He said, when you're older, I'm going to show you what's wrong with people. And you tell them, and it'll give them faith to receive from your prayer. And he's been doing that for almost 50 years now, going, heading up on 70 years old. This is one meeting he was at in Ohio that was very powerful. So I just want you to see that the Holy Ghost is real. Not mystical, not weird. He cares about you. Can you say amen? amen. God doesn't want to watch you struggle. He wants to help you. And I pray you let him in. Watch this. It'll build your faith. Go ahead, guys. Go out. As the ripples go out, that means you get a touch, even though I may not be speaking to you specifically. If you'll release your faith, God will touch you. Amen? Hold your glasses in your hand. You have two conditions. Even though you have glasses, what it doesn't reveal, you're starting to lose your sight in one of your eyes, and there's pressure building up. Isn't that right? True? Sure, I'm having surgery. No, don't even go there. I haven't prayed for you yet. Yes, yes. Can I take my coat off? Now listen, <clears throat> I was kidding. We understand that a great church like this has staff who are taking care of your children. If you're a parent and you need to get your children, it's all right. But I, 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 I'm going to pray for people for a minute. Yes, sir. Because the Lord told me, I saw you in my room when I prayed yesterday. You will not go blind in your right eye. You understand that? And whatever else the Lord would show, I receive it. You feel that? That's the Holy Ghost. I command that spirit of blindness to come out. She shall not lose her eyesight. Can you help her back up? Thank you. Everybody lift your hands. The anointing's here. Also, you've been struggling to get your sugar into the right level and your blood pressure. And the Lord now, I command your blood pressure to go to normal. Sugar levels stay in the normal level. The eye is healed. Vision. Someone shout vision. Amen. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. May I pray for you, ma'am? Come here, please. Man, six guys. This is a well-organized church. Yes, ma'am. Bless your heart. Take my hand. When you have a broken heart or you've lost something, it hurts. But the Lord is going to restore to you today what the devil took. Do you believe that? Amen. A couple of weeks ago, you almost said, well, what's the use of even serving God if these things happen? Isn't that right? Yes. You sat on the edge of a bed. I see the vision. And you said, Lord, if you're real, somehow show me that you're going to help me. D didn't you say that? It was in your bedroom, isn't that right? And I wasn't there, but I am now by the Spirit. The power of God's on her. She shall not go to hell. She shall not turn her back on the Lord. She shall receive a touch. You ready? You shall be filled with the Holy Ghost and serve God with a great fire. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Lift your hand. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord shows me you've been faithful. This is your church. Is that right? And somehow you've served Brother Parsley in the past. And uh, by partnering and praying and believing. I see that. When you share with another, such as our dear brother Parsley, who we love, then there's a measure of that reward the Bible speaks of that comes on you. You believe that with me? I won't do this. Lay your hand right here on your chest. 
I command a supernatural anointing to come on your body today to strengthen you, to strengthen you. I don't understand it other than the Lord shows me sometimes the rhythm of your heart gets a little off and your heart will race a little bit and you feel it. Isn't that right? That's correct. And uh, you've had physicals, you've been checked, but you have been kind of watching it. Would that be a good way to say it? That's correct. Kind of watching it. <laughs> Wait on the Lord. Everybody lift your hands. Others of you that may have had issues with heart shall be healed. I command the rhythm of your heart to stay normal. When it does, your blood pressure will come to the right level and stay there, not up and down like you've been dealing with. Isn't that right? And then recently in the back of your neck and shoulder, isn't that right? That's good. Arthritis has tried to come in your bones and to cripple you up in a form of rheumatism. But I curse all the itis brothers. Arthur and the whole crowd, bursitis, all the itis. By impartation and laying on the hands, you sh there shall be healed in your body. Someone say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Someone say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Someone say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and give God the glory. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb of God. We give you the glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Someone say forever and forevermore. Everybody lay your hand on your body and receive healing if you need it, strength if you need it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. May I pray for you, ma'am? Come, please. Take a walk of faith with us. Mm, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? Oh, where would I be? You go to this church, ma'am? You believe Jesus will touch you today? You have something in your body that needs to be healed. And the Lord will do it. You believe that with me? Yes, I do. I won't do this. Lay your hand on this part of your stomach. You've had some symptoms, but you just pass it off. Okay. Not maybe. You know you have. Sometimes it pains there a little bit, and then when you turn, you feel it. Isn't that right? Yes. Amen. You must be a new believer. I'll just use my faith. I curse this cancer in the name of Christ. Be healed. Hallelujah. Hello. Someone say, yes, Lord. Say, yes, Lord. Power of God is here. Lift your hands. The anointing is here. Stand, little lady. Step out in the aisle. Look at me. You know I don't know you. As far as I know, we've never spoken. You need healed in your back, and the Lord's going to do it. Isn't that right? You have three discs that have deteriorated down to nothing. Isn't that right? Yes. Now, how do I know that unless God really does speak to me? And apparently, he still wants us to be here at 5 after 12 because he's still moving. Isn't that right? Yes. And then one of your hips now has begun to go bad. Are those things so? They are so. What would you say if I told you that you shall receive the working of miracles now? I'm not going to pray for God to heal three bad discs. I'm going to ask him to give you all new ones. Hold her up. Right through here. Isn't that right? Yes. Where my hand is. Yes. You could have said, no, it's up higher, but it's right here. No, it's right there. Did you feel that move? Yes. I believe he's doing it right now. Yes. Loose. Oh. Now, if someone touched you, that would be painful, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. 
Watch this. You don't feel that, do you? Thank you, Lord, for three brand new discs and a new hip. Hallelujah. What's that? I thought he forgot about me. You thought he forgot about you. Watch this. Take my hands. Take my hands. Take a step of faith. Now watch this. Stand on your feet, everybody. Give the Lord a great big hand clap that he's a God who cares about you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I grew up in meetings like that. God's a real God. People have real problems, but God has real power to solve those problems. So notice what Jesus said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. So it's the problem's not on Jesus' end. He said, I'm willing. I've been knocking at the door. I've been wanting to, to come into your heart. But you have to let him in. You can't let the devil saddle you with a bunch of reasons why, well, no, I got too many things wrong. Jesus didn't say, straighten your life out and come to me. He said, come just as you are, and I'll give you new life. Can you say amen? One thing I know for sure is one of the reasons Christ hasn't raptured the church is that many that right now, if Christ were to come back, they wouldn't be ready to meet him. Whatever happened in life that got you separated from God, if Jesus were to come right now, you wouldn't be ready to meet him. But that's why he hasn't come back yet. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord isn't willing that any should perish, so He's giving more time for everyone to repent and be saved. One thing I know for sure is going to happen these last six months of this year is people that the devil thought would have never escaped his grip and made heaven their home, he's going to lose them by the multitude. And tonight, you know, right now, actually, I'm not really concerned about what God has planned the rest of the year. I'm, I'm concerned with right now. And there's people here that if, the, if you were going to stand before God in 60 seconds time, you know you wouldn't be ready to meet Him. There's things you've allowed into your lifestyle the Bible calls sin. You can't stand before God on judgment day with unholiness. But all you have to do to get rid of it, you don't work it off. All you do is surrender it. I give you my life. I turn my back on sin. I acknowledge that I've sinned, and I repent. Repent is an acknowledgement. I've sinned, and now, with your help, I turn my back on it to go in the opposite direction. Instead of pursuing my own interests, I'm going to live like the Bible tells me to live. Then people say, I don't think I can live like that. Good news. You're right. Nobody can live like this in their own power. But the Bible says in John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons and daughters of God. God will put a wellspring of that power on the inside of you. Where it won't be you trying to be a good boy or a good girl. There will be a fire on the inside of you to do what's right. In a world that celebrates wickedness, you won't care. I'm going to tell you, man, you need to come on that side. You can't be in the middle. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go crazy and party and stuff. but I, No, the middle gets run over. You should make up your mind. I'm going to serve the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, and all my physical strength. If you do that, you become an unstoppable force. Then God will begin to use you to set other people free. Think of it in the future when somebody tells you, man, you don't know what I've done. Yeah, no, no, I don't know. I was you. And God brought me out of the muddy clay and put my feet on the rock to stay. Because it's not just about you. Once you give your life to the Lord, the devil, the, God will make you a battering ram to the gates of hell. 
I pray that a bunch of people get serious with God tonight and the devil rules the day for the rest of his life that he ever let you go out of his grip. Because not only do you make heaven, you turn people away from him and turn their heart to Christ with regularity in Jesus' name. There's greatness on the inside of you. God has a destiny to use you in this last day revival. God will speak to you. God will give you the ability to pray for people and set them free. But it starts with you surrendering your life. My Uncle Ted that you just watched trained under an evangelist named R.W. Shambach. He used to say at every altar call, Jesus will either be everything or he'll be nothing at all. And it's true. Total surrender. Jesus didn't give you part of his life. He gave you all of his life on the cross. And he said, if you'll surrender your life like that to me, I'll give you my life and I'll use you. I'll make you great in your generation. And I'm looking for somebody to do that tonight. To say, I'm done. Look, what, look at the criticism Jesus had of this church. Not, not Fitchburg. I'm talking the end time church. I would that you were hot or cold. But since you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. That's American Christianity. American Christianity is lukewarm Christianity. Well, yeah, I believe that. I, I believe the Bible. There's some truth to it. That, that doesn't cut it. People have enough of the world so they're not on fire and enough of the church that they're not ice cold. They're lukewarm. But tonight I'm going to call you to do what Jesus called you to do. Get out of coldness. Get out of lethargy. Get out of indifference and lukewarmness and say, I'm coming over to the side of Christ and holiness. I'm going to allow my life to be used of God to set the captives free. Whether you're young or old. Whether you've once done this years ago or you've never done it, I want to give you an opportunity to do something tonight that will truly change your life. You can lay your head down on your pillow shortly and know that you have peace with God. That God doesn't remember one thing that happened before today. And He'll set you free from every chain that the devil tried to wrap you with to bind and destroy you. It'll never work again. I want the privilege to pray with you. I want you to open the door of your heart to Jesus Christ. And let him in. You'll never regret. You will never regret it. I surrendered my life to Jesus when I was four, four and a half. I turned 40 in September. I don't have one day that way. I wish I didn't take it. So I'm telling you, we used to sing a song growing up in church. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And I'm telling you, when you walk with Christ, you don't have bad days. He said, surely goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. Even when the enemy plans for you to have a bad day, you come out of it with a testimony in Jesus' name. But you have to surrender your heart. You don't do it over time. Think of it. That man was crippled 38 years. One day, she said, would you like to get better? I don't have any, anybody to help me. You don't need anyone to help you. I'm here, Jesus said. Stand up. There has to come a day where you just make that. That's the day. For you, July 19th. That's the day I decided I'm coming over to receive Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you say, Jonathan, that's me. I don't want to go home wondering whether I'm right with God. One foot in, one foot up. I want to make up my mind tonight. I will serve the Lord. I'm done with sin. I'm done with the devil. I give my life to Jesus Christ and I'm doing it tonight. I want you to quickly put your hand up high and wave it at me, and we're going to pray right now. Do it boldly and unashamed. I see you. I see you on the left. I see you front row. Who else? I see you. I see you, sir. I'm going to give it 20 more seconds. If the Lord's dealing with your heart, this will be your night. I see you. God bless you. Those of you that lifted a hand, or if God's still dealing with your heart, the reason we call you forward to the altar to pray is not to single you out or embarrass you. We do this because Jesus said, Luke chapter 12, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father that's in heaven. It has to be public. Where you come out of the crowd and just make up your mind. It's not important to me what people think. I care what God thinks. But you know what? If you wanted to know what people thought of you here anyway, they're going to be super happy for you. Because they've all made the move too, and they're going to celebrate you very quickly. Everybody that lifted a hand and meant business with God, come out of your seat and come to the altar right now. We're going to pray. I won't hold you long. We're going to pray. Make the, Tonight, the night you get right with God. Every hand that was lifted, come. Keep coming. I'll wait for you.
Come now, you can come as friends, but come, don't stay in your seat. Every person lifted a hand. Come right to the center if you would. Anybody else before we pray? God bless. All right, come on. All right. I feel good. Lift both hands to the Lord. I'm going to lead you in the prayer to pray. Make these words your own. Say them from the bottom of your heart. And God hears this prayer. And he'll cleanse all, the, all your sins out. Give you new life even as you pray it. Say it out loud. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. I admit that I've sinned. I repent. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Right now, I receive forgiveness. I receive salvation in Jesus' name. Now let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for my new sister and my two new brothers who have entered into your kingdom. I thank you that their sins are all forgiven. And now, give them boldness and strength to live for you in a world that celebrates wickedness. Give them a passion for righteousness and for pleasing you. In Jesus' name, everything the enemy used to try to destroy their life, I thank you it falls off them for good now. In Jesus' name, I thank you for it, Lord, and I give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You can look up at me. Welcome to the family of God. Your sins are all forgiven. Let me give you two things before you go back to your seat. Very important that you get plugged into a good church. So if you don't have a home church, please make this your home church. Pastor Brian is top notch, five star. So, and then if you already have a home church, I would just encourage you to immediately leave that church and make this your home church. And then second, I'll be here all week. And I don't preach the same sermon every night. So I'd love to see you again, 7 o'clock every night. Welcome to the family. Your sins are all forgiven. And we're proud of you. You can go back to your seats. God bless you. Give them a hand clap as they return to their seat. God bless you. Give Jesus a great big hand clap. Now, now I'm going to pray for everybody who wants prayer. I'm going to have you lift your left hand up to the Lord and then put your right hand wherever you're believing God to do something. If it's an, an addiction, you want to put it on your heart or your mouth. If it's a problem in your body, you can put your right hand wherever the problem on the body is. If you've got like 13 things that need healed, you can just put your hand on top of your head. That'll be a signal to God you need an overhaul. God's going to help you right now. I said God's going to help you right now. I'm going to pray, and I don't mean for God to help you over the next seven years. I'm talking about knock out of you whatever the enemy tried to put in you. The same way Jesus knocked the crippledness out of that guy's legs. And then you saw in my uncle's video, Jesus hasn't changed. The anointing's the same. That's why I like that clip. It's a nine-minute clip. You see uh, blind eye, heart arrhythmia, crippling back ailment. That lady that was suffering from severe depression, about to give up on life. The same anointing of the Holy Ghost will take care of all of it. Can you say amen? amen. Every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you from the depth of my heart. I thank you for every person who's here. I pray for those who have been ravaged like that guy in John 5 with a physical ailment that makes life difficult to live, painful to get out of bed in the morning, difficult to get through the day. I loose your healing miracle power into their body now. In Jesus' name, I curse cancer. Every unclean cell of cancer, I curse it and command it to come out now in the name of Jesus. I command the bodies in the sound of my voice to listen to the word of the Lord. Be healed. Anything that's been damaged in an accident, 
even if it's a problem they brought on themselves by their, their living before they knew the Lord. I thank you for restoring everything that's been damaged in their body now. In Jesus' name, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, I loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost to make you every whit whole, to make you strong. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. Just standing just like you are with your eyes closed and your hands where they are. Begin to thank God out of your mouth that He's doing it right now. Praise seals it. Praise multiplies what the Lord's done. So begin to open up your mouth and just say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for touching me. Thank you for making me well. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. I pray, I join my faith with you for life to not be a struggle anymore. For life not to be hard anymore. In Jesus' name, for you to have the joy of the Lord restored back to you, where you wake up with a smile on your face. Enjoy the day with your family. In Jesus' mighty name. I pray for those that are battling invisible things. Thoughts of suicide, depression, something left over from from a bad experience when you were a child or a, a teenager. I curse those, whatever was given entrance into your life, that torments you the same way Jesus freed that woman's daughter from a tormenting spirit, Matthew 15. I command you to be free now in Jesus' name. Free at last and free forever. This lady with the blonde hair in this section, with the glasses on your head, would you mind if I prayed for you? Just step right out into the aisle. The power of God's all over you. You don't have to come any closer. Just lift your hands up right there. As you do, the power of God comes on you even stronger. yours. Keep your hands lifted. Just let the Lord touch you all over this place. The Bible says God is a very present help in time of trouble. He'll help you right now. This lady with, with uh, let's see, row one, two, three, four. Would you mind if I prayed for you? You can, you can, you can opt out. God bless you. Lift both hands. Close both eyes. Put one hand where your belly is. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Down through your legs. touch you. Would you mind if I pray for you, sir? Just step right on the aisle. Lift both hands. Close both eyes. Put one hand on your heart. Lift the other one up to the Lord. give you a new heart, extend your life in Jesus' name. If you're into social distancing, make sure to stay at least six feet away from me. In Jesus' name. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just lift your hands one more time wherever you're at. Let the Lord touch you. Thank you, Jesus. I hate to call you Doug's sister, but lift both hands. Let me see your right hand. Receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in fire. The Lord's going to give you a fresh anointing right now. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lift your hands one more time. Just begin to thank the Lord out of your mouth. Let Jesus touch you wherever you're at. He's a real God, and He really cares about you. Now, since you came here, I'm going to bless you. 
And my blessings work. I don't bless people when they sneeze. We have both hands all over this place. Anything you lost in the first six months of this year, you received double back before the end of this year. In Jesus' name. This year is not going to end with you having a story of loss. This year is going to end with you having a story of how the Lord gave you a testimony. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for one more person. This lady in the front row, just take two steps forward. The power of God's on you real strong. Put one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly. As you do, the power of God comes on you right now. Jesus' name. I know we already prayed at the altar, but just lift your hands one more time in the yellow shirt. Close both eyes. The Lord's going to give you strength. Where it's like, how am I going to do this? There's like not one challenge or two challenges. There's like a myriad of challenges you need help with. The Lord says, don't worry. I'm going to help you with all. God's already gone into your future and cleared them all out for you. How's that? So all you'll have to do is go forward. Take a step out to the aisle real quick. Lift your other hand to the Lord. And you're free. You're free for the rest of your life. In Jesus' name. Go ahead, give the Lord a great big hand clap. Come on, give Jesus a great big hand clap. Somebody shout a living hallelujah. We have tomorrow through Friday, 7 o'clock. Come to as many as you can. If you can't get here right at 7, it's going to take you till 8 or 8.15 to get here. I promise you, I'll still be preaching at 8.15. And I'm not going to yell at you when you come in the door, you know, where were you? It started at 7. I understand people have to work and stuff. You have to legally cut people's hair in your house. I get it. So don't make as many meetings as you can and bring people out, which it looks like. It's like a Friday crowd, isn't it? It's like usually what we finish with. I, I, I know it's going to be a great week. I know I said I was done praying for people. This lady all the way in the back with the blazer on, blonde hair. Yep, just take one step over to your left. Lift both hands to the Lord. Close both eyes. I know the enemy hits you with a shot. You're, you were anointed. The enemy hit, hit you with a shot, tried to take you out of, of the anointing. But today the Lord not only delivers you and puts you right back on track, but He restores His anointing on your life and you'll be used mightily of God. Ready? In Jesus' name. More. 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 There it is. You'll never be the same. There it is. The joy of the Lord that'll be your strength from now till you go to heaven. Now give the Lord one more great hand clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say it out loud. My best days are not behind me. My best days are in front of me. And I'm going to get there in Jesus' name. You guys, you have buckets. Just line them up on the altar. You guys have had plenty of teaching on the offering. I might do it once before the week's over. If you're making out a check, making out the Crossroads Community Church, those of you who came wanting to give something to uh, Revival Today, the ministry of Evangelist Dallas, and uh, myself, Jonathan Shuttlesworth, if you want to stand with us to preach the gospel in this last hour of time, then we'll give you the opportunity. I'm going to have the band play us. <laughs> By the way, you did a phenomenal job. Happy songs, praiseful songs. We're going to go out with a song of victory. And um, make sure to not say hi, uh, bye to anyone on the way out. Don't talk to anyone. Don't look anyone in the eyes.
Don't go near anybody. No human contact whatsoever. We love you. How many of you have been blessed tonight? I'm going to have Pastor Brian give you a proper benediction, and I'll see you tomorrow night. Give the Lord another great hand clap. Go ahead.